We're in the gate. And they're off. Lamborghini, very alert out of the gate. Mischief's Causeway on the outside takes second. Just a guess, not far behind third. Motivating forces next, two by four under a hold in the early stages. Fifth and four lengths off the speed. Size does matter. Keep moving on is second to last and stagger Lee at the back of the field. Eight lengths covers them rounding the first turn. Lamborghini, the pacemaker, prompted by Mischief's Causeway in second. It's another four back to Just a Guess, who races by himself in third. Then motivating force, fourth and five lengths off the lead. He's followed by two by four, inching up in the green down at the rail. Size does matter is next, followed by keep moving on and stagger Lee. They come to the half mile pole and it's Edwin Maldonado and Lamborghini in control by a length and a half. Mischief's Causeway is in second and just a guess inches a little bit closer. At the rail, two by four joins motivating force. They're side by side and four lengths off the lead. Behind them, size does matter and keep moving on. Stagger Lee has been at the back throughout. Lamborghini, Mischief's Causeway, a neck back second. Two more lengths to Just a Guess in third. Two by four, still traveling well on the inside, looking for a spot to run now. On the far outside, size does matter. Two by four, trying to slip through a narrow opening between rivals at the eighth pole. Lamborghini still in front, Just a Guess on the outside. Mischief's Causeway, outside, size does matter. And at the rail, two by four, Lamborghini, size does matter. Here's the line, photo finish, looked like. Lamborghini might have just held off. An oncoming size does matter, but it got close right at the wire. Behind them, Mischief's Causeway, just a guess, and two by four. Outside, size does matter. Two by four trying to slip through a narrow opening between rivals at the eighth pole. Lamborghini still in front, just a guess on the outside. Mischief. <laughs> Stozo. They've loaded quickly. And they're off. Eligio in the center of the racetrack, joined by the favorite eight clap who flies through now to take command. And so it's eight clap to set the pace. Eligio at half length back in second. Gostoso on the far outside, followed by smiling Jojo and no show Jones four off the lead. Past a half mile, and it is eight clap, a half length in front. Eligio trying to press in second, but the lead extends to a length three furlongs from the money. Then it's smiling Jojo in third. Gostoso is four lengths off them, and another three or four back to no show Jones. Approaching the quarter pole with eight clap to catch, sailing along with an easy two length lead. Eligio sells second. Three back, Gostoso and smiling Jojo. They're coming to the eighth pole, and eight clap continues to extend that margin. It's up to four. Eligio, Gostoso, and smiling Jojo left well behind eight clap, who outclasses the field and wins for fun. Eight clap keeps on going to win it by six lengths. Eligio was second, Gostoso third in front of smiling Jojo. Lansdowne will be the last one to load. We're in the gate. And they're off, and Mubtada is very fast. Opens up a length in the first few jumps. Forgiving Spirit comes through now to challenge him, but Mubtada is in hand while leading. Jettifader is up close, a length and a half off the pacemakers. Then it is Lansdowne, Gregorian Chant between, and Johnny Padres at the rail. Moves up to take fourth. Forgiving Spirit has emerged with the lead at the half-mile pole. Has it by a length over Mubtada in second. Then Jettivator joined by Johnny Padres. And in between those two, Gregorian Chant lands down at the back. Around the turn, Forgiving Spirit a half length. Mubtada moves once again to engage. And Mubtada right on even terms with a quarter of a mile to go. Has his gray head in front now. 
Two back to Genovator in third. Down at the rail, Johnny Padres and Gregorian Chant. Top of the stretch and Muptada in a nice battle with Forgiving Spirit. They're head and head, neither giving an inch. Johnny Padres along the inside, gathering late momentum. Forgiving Spirit on the inside. Muptada, and here's Johnny Padres with a big surge, getting up. Johnny Padres. Then a photo and a close one between Muptada and Forgiving Spirit. And they're off. Indian Dreamer, Bella Pork, wasn't the best of beginnings, but that's no longer an issue as she's in front a length and a half. Bossy Bruin Gal is close up, moving up between rivals, and another three back to Warren's Wild Ride. Half mile to run, Bella Pork a half length in front of Bossy Bruin Gal. Indian Dreamer, two and a half off the leader in third, and Warren's Wild Ride into the far turn. Heavily favored Bellipok and Bossy Bruin Gal within a neck, traveling nicely too. Another two and a half to Indian Dreamer and Warren's Wild Ride moves up to claim third as they come to the quarter pole. Bellipok at the rail, Bossy Bruin Gal, and here's Warren's Wild Ride joining the fray. Three wide, top of the lane. Bellipok just in front, leads it a length. Between rivals, Bossy Bruin Gal trying hard, and Warren's Wild Ride on the outside, moving into second late, 16th to go. Belle Poke, Warren's Wild Ride, Bossy Bruin Gal keep fighting together for second, but Belle Poke too strong. Maldonado and O'Neill team up for another. Bossy Bruin Gal outgamed Warren's Wild Ride, then Indian Dreamer. They're in the gate. Movement from Bougie like straightens up. And they're off. Very even start. Hey Demps, take care of me along the inside. Here's Bougie like joining the party on the outside of them, and Isabel Ludlow will back off of the pace battle. Just in behind them comes Glacier Rim, who's down on the inside of Blondzilla with Ashley's Sandcastle. And about six lengths covers the entire field. Take Karami goes on to the back stretch, leading with less than six furlongs to travel. Hey Demps a length and a half back second. Followed by Isabel Ludlow, saving ground along the rail, and Bougie Like is in fourth, four lengths off the leader. Glacier Rim, Ashley Sandcastle are right together, and Blonzilla two behind them. At the half mile pole, it's Take Karami leading the way at a big number. Has it by a half length. Hey Demps, the gray in second. On the inside, Isabel Ludlow. The other gray is third. Bougie like fourth on the outside, three lengths off the leaders. Then Glacier Rim in the green. Ashley Sandcastle has five lengths to make up. And Blonzilla goes three wide outside of that pair as Hey Demps is the new leader a quarter of a mile from home. Bougie like dropping right out of it. It's Hey Demps a length and a half. Take care of me on the inside second. It's been a good trip for Isabel Ludlow who will angle out for the drive. Then Ashley Sandcastle and on the inside Glacier Rim. Hey Demps two length lead a 16th out. Isabel Ludlow, Ashley Sandcastle getting going but it's a little late and it will be Hey Demps. Hey Demps with a good trip to victory. Scores under Armando Ayuso. Isabel Ludlow. Ashley Sandcastle, Glacier Rim, and a long way back between Blondzilla and Take Care of Me. Period to the outside. We're in the gate. They're off. Power Surge is going out for the early lead. Grace Period far outside. Princess of Time and Jensko.
They're very close together, obviously, as they run down the back stretch. Princess of Time by a head. Power Surge at the rail second. Jensko three deep, just a half length back, while in hand third, and two more back to Grace, period. They head toward the three-eighth pole. Power Surge on the inside leads by a head to Princess of Time. Half length back, Jensko still three wide, cruising up to them now, and another three back to Grace, period. Princess of Time and Jensko go on with it. Power Surge dropping back at the rail third. And then Grace period. They have a quarter of a mile to run. And Jensko up to take the lead. Princess of Time along the inside. These two to fight it out coming toward the eighth pole. It's Jensko. And a game Princess of Time far from done at the rail. Jensko, Princess and Time, nose and nose. Princess of Time, Flavian Pratt. Jensko, Hector Berrios. And Princess of Time, Struts her stuff late and wins, handwritten by almost two. Jensko second, grace period third, and then power surge. In the gate. And they're off. Quick start for Rebel Girl, who's going to vie for the lead, but Sakura flavors a little bit faster and takes over. Yarborough, Milagro do Sol is down on the inside, and here's Freedom Last with the white blinkers on the outside coming to join the party. So they come into the stretch for the first time, and Sakura flavor will be the pace setter. Leads it by a length and a half. Freedom Last is in second. Rebel Girl tucked in along the fence in third. Then Etheric in the clear, just three lengths off the leaders. They're followed by Yarbrough between horses, Milagre do Sol, second to last, and Rough Ride, six lengths, covers the entire field. They're moving into the clubhouse turn. It's Sakura Flavor and Antonio Freysu. Uncontested up top, Freedom Last in second. Then Rebel Girl at the rail, White Cap in third. Etheric in the clear, still fourth. Yarbrough, Milagro do Sol, and at the back of the field is Rough Ride. They swing on to the back stretch. Sakura Flavor continues at a very moderate clip, leading the way three parts of a length to Freedom Last in second. Etheric is getting a little bit closer. Third, just two lengths off the pacemaker as they come to the half mile pole. Rebel Girl is down at the rail, patiently handled in Yarborough fifth. Milagre do Sol still second to last and rough ride at the back. Moving into the far turn, Sakura Flavor, Freedom Last tries to engage now second. At the rail, Rebel Girl taking third away from Etheric, who's lost some ground. Yarborough fifth, five off the lead, rough ride, red blinkers outside, and Milagre do Sol. They pass the quarter pole and Freedom Last up to take the lead. Sakura Flavor has to respond. It's been a good journey for Rebel Girl who swings out. Center of the course, it's Rough Ride. Final furlong. Freedom Last opens up to Rough Ride's coming fast. Here's Rough Ride after Freedom Last. Freedom Last or Rough Ride. Rough Ride. Right on the money. Timed perfectly by Juan Hernandez to nab Freedom Last. Milagro do Sol is down on the inside, and here's Freedom Last with the white blinkers on the outside coming to join the party. So they come into... And 10. With those scratches, please take note of a revised morning line. Post time for the 8th on the board right now in 23 minutes. Tax Outlaw. And they're off. Divine Feminine out alertly, but it's Paco's Pico. A little more speed. Set the Cento. Summer's Shandy. Tembo is down at the rail. Jack's Outlaw is well out in the center of the racetrack and at the back of the field looking for revenge. Rounding the clubhouse turn, Summer Shandy comes through and tackles Paco's Pico. Paco's Pico, however, maintains the advantage. Just behind them, Tembo in the light blue colors third, 
And then comes Divine Feminine in the white and red. Down at the rail, it's set to Gento, fifth, but only four lengths off the lead. It's then another three lengths back to looking for revenge on the inside of Jack's Outlaw. Seven lengths covers them. They're coming to the half-mile pole. And it's Paco's Pico, the controlling speed by two and a half lengths. Tembo is now a clear-cut second. Divine Feminine takes third. Summer Shandy is losing ground with every stride. Set to Cento just went by that rival. Looking for revenge is doing the same. And Jack's outlaw at the back. Less than three eighths to go. It's Paco's Pico, the leader. Here's Tembo moving to challenge in second. Three back divine feminine hard ridden third. And then set to Cento. They pass the quarter pole. Tembo on the outside. And Paco's Pico. Paco's Pico trying to fend him off coming to the eighth pole. Leads it a length. Tembo took that big run at him and is still trying hard in second. Four back to Divine Feminine. Paco's Pico, Tembo coming back. Paco's Pico or Tembo. Paco's Pico ahead to Tembo. They're going to hit the wire together. Paco's Pico, Tembo. Paco's Pico would not be denied. Another for Frey Sue. Tembo was second. Then it was Divine Feminine, followed by Set to Cento, looking for revenge, battled it out for fifth with Summer Shandy. In the gate, and they're off. Ice Queen is going out for the early lead. Quarry of Thunder has plenty of early gas. Tapitu comes away in third. Chasing Serendipity, fourth in the opening furlong. Violet Storm built different, and three to a crown for Kitten. Rounding the first turn, and it's Ice Queen showing the way. Has it a length and a half to Quarry of Thunder in second. Then comes Chasing Serendipity down at the rail, and the red color's third. Tapadu is fourth, three and a half off the pace, followed by Violet Storm, built different in a crown for Kitten. On to the backstretch, Ice Queen, the boss, three quarters. Quarry of Thunder in second still, and Chasing Serendipity under a tight hold third. Tapadu is fourth. Violet Storm bottled up along the inside, fifth. Racing about four lengths off the lead as they head into the far turn. And the lead still belongs to Ice Queen. It's three quarters of a length, pressed by Quarry of Thunder in second. Tap it due third. At the rail, chasing Serendipity. Built different outside Violet Storm. And down at the rail, a crown for Kitten. They're a quarter of a mile from home. And Ice Queen still there. Turns for home with the lead. Has to sprint away now and leads by two. At the rail, chasing Serendipity. Quarry of Thunder is just outside of her. A final furlong for Ice Queen, a length and a half. Quarry of Thunder trying very hard. Ice Queen digging in on the outside. Quarry of Thunder, it will be Ice Queen all the way under Umberto Rispoli. Nursing that speed to perfection. Quarry of Thunder was second. Photo third, chasing Serendipity and a crown for Kitten, followed by Violet Storm.
Hi, everybody, and welcome to the 87th running of the Grade 1 Sanita Handicap presented by Yamava Resort and Casino. And as you look through the history rolls of the previous winners of the Big Cap, it reads like a who's who of superstar thoroughbreds. Let me give you an example. Lava Man, Tiz Now, Best Pal, Ali Sheba, Broadbrush, John Henry, Spectacular Big, Sp uh, Spectacular Bid, Affirmed, Vigers, Akak, -Ak, and of course, the three-time winner, Game On Dude. We're excited to present not only the Sanita Handicap today, but multiple graded stakes races as well and the weather is good you can see on the screen that you're watching the main track is good and the turf course is good that's right all turf races today remain on the turf course i'm very honored to welcome our very special guest today he hasn't seen all 87 big caps but he's certainly seen his fair share his name brad free brad happy big cap day welcome how do you, to the seminar. How do you know i haven't seen all 87 of them <laughs> well, you, not... you look good for your age <laughs> but we've seen our fair share we, both you we, and i we have and you know i knew you were going to ask me about the history of the big cap typically my favorite memories of a big race correspond with a big score looking through the history of the big cap i don't have a whole lot to brag about to be quite jeff siegel does that's one of my favorite big caps of all time it was in 1989 it was one of the first big caps i covered i think i was working for the pasadena star news you and puck. yeah marshall law martin won, pedroza and, uh, julio canani jeff siegel with clover racing and I, that it was it was just an absolute stunner for some crazy reason the track became extremely speed biased that day and i believe the one two three pace setters ran that way all the way around try team try and stylish winner martial law i think sat second and he sprang an unbelievable upset that's one of my favorite big cat memories i didn't make a dime on the race but it was really cool to watch that unfold just goes to show you put a good horse in a race and some Sometimes good things can happen. Uh, one one final good, it's a memory. It's not really a, a fond memory, but it's one of uh, a, a significant memory. 1994, the Wicked North, trained by yes. David Bernstein. And I don't usually like to harp on stewards' decisions because, look, it's not an easy job. But they got it wrong that day. The Wicked North was best in the big cap. He was disqualified for alleged interference with a horse named My Rackaloo, whose jockey put the horse in a bad spot. And the Wicked North, it was 30 years ago, 1994, wow. that he was disqualified from the big cap. Again, I didn't make a penny or didn't lose a penny because of the DQ, but I was so disgruntled, I just I left the track after the race. I wasn't covering it for anybody. I just left. I was so sour. It was just a, it's a memory, though. It's it, not a great memory, but a memory. It is a memory, and you and I were both there for both of those occasions, and all the track is starting to pick up a little bit of steam with the on-track attendance today. Nothing's going to compare to those old days, right? Because we didn't have ADWs. We didn't have a satellite wagering. Everybody had to be on track if they wanted to wager. But those are just great memories. For those of us who really aren't that old, We, you know, you don't have to go that far back to remember what a great race it is. And even today, as we were talking before we came on air, it's still a good race because all seven runners do have a chance to win. They do. And, you know, just watching the connections of the last couple of years, they understand the tradition and significance of the big cap last year it was ed Mosier train stiletto boy owned by his brother steve and i remember in the winter circle afterward they talked about how important it was to win that race a couple years ago it was lee searing who's been coming to the racetrack forever and he won with um, express train trained by john sheriffs and he talked about how cool it was to win a big cap it's not the race it once was we have to compete with the $20 million Saudi Cup, the $12 million Dubai World Cup, but it's still a pretty cool race in March at Santa Anita. And it's kind of the granddaddy of them all, just like the Rose Bowl down the street, right? That's what makes yep. it so important in racing history. It was one of the first big races way back when, and it's kind of carried out in that tradition to this day. No doubt about it. And today's more, uh, program favorite is a horse that's already won a couple of graded stakes on his way to the big cap. So we'll talk about that more later on. What about the Frankie Kilroe Mile? That's been kind of an important race, you know, leading up to the Breeders' Cup Mile as well. We've got a few good runners in there, including DeJour, who's going to be one of the favorites, trained by Bob Baffert. Yeah, and Easter as well, trained by Phil D'Amato. You know, the grass division in California probably is a little bit second tier relative to, certainly relative to the uh, Europeans. So they come out here and dominate every Breeders' Cup grass event. And even on the East Coast, I think their grass horses are better. But uh, the thing I like about today's kill row is you got nine starters in the race, including one of my favorite horses to watch run because he has that crazy front running style, Goliad. He goes out there and goes 45 and change and says, <laughs> Catch me if you can. It's just a fun horse to watch. I, he might be up against it today, 
but you have to respect his speed. First piece, of course, stretching out off a big turf win. And then the two favorites, Easter and DuJour. The news broke yesterday, Brad, and you actually broke it about 24 hours ago in race six, which goes as the DK horse grade two San Felipe stakes. The one to five morning line favorite, Niso, scratched out of the race. Bob Baffert basically told you, look, he's just not ready to run. I'm going to wait for another spot. Yeah, I have to give credit to... Uh, Kevin Modesti of the Los Angeles Daily News, he beat me by seven minutes on Twitter. So he saw he, a lot of big caps as well back in the day, didn't he? And he's back on the beat as well. <laughs> Just walked news. in with him. Uh, Kevin Modesti broke the news first before I did. Um, I talked to Baffert yesterday, af yesterday morning after it became official, and I, I suspect that there might be more to the story than any of us knows, but I do say, will say this. I believe Baffert when he says the horse is fine. Cause I asked him point blank, is he okay physically? And Baffert said, yes. And I believe him. I think we're going to see him in the Santa Anita Derby. And I expect the nice will probably win that race if he's in the starting gate. So nice We don't get to watch him run this afternoon. Um, but I think the horse is fine and he has plenty more races down the road. You and I have both been around long enough. Sometimes horses run so fast. It actually knocks them for a, Luke physically. Nysos has run three races, total combined winning victory margin is 25 lengths. You don't see that very often with lightly raced horses. And sometimes they just literally run out of their skin. Yeah. And that's what Baffert mentioned that when I spoke with him yesterday, he said, look, the horse ran so big in his most recent start, he earned a 105 buyer speed figure. That's off the charts for a three-year-old in February. They don't run that fast. Um, and that's one of the reasons that Baffert said he elected to take him out he changed his mind um sometimes horses run too fast and they are unable to re reproduce that in fact we've seen that a couple times this year with some runaway maiden winners back on the east coast and midwest hall of fame ran off this charts with a huge number in a maiden race you couldn't find him next time out um nash he was a huge winner in the uh i think the midwest for trainer brad cox he ran like a, a, won his maiden race like a freak and then you couldn't find him his next two start you could find him but he didn't run repeat the performance the point is when a horse runs as fast as nisos did and even those two others i mentioned they are not always automatic to reproduce that figure especially with a developing three-year-old who's only started three times the irony brad is with the scratch of nisos race six which begins the 50 cent late pick five granted there might only be four, uh, four runners left but all of the four could technically win right it's a better betting race with the defection of nisos yeah, even the maiden mcveigh i'd be I'd take a long, close look at him. He's a maiden, but he has tons of ability. He's just a little bit uh, cuckoo upstairs at this point in the game. What's your favorite wager, Brad? We've got about a minute left, but you you, know, you pretty much plow it through the windows every day. Do you like the early 50-cent pick five? I know you were a big advocate of the return of the $1 pick six. Like when you step up to the plate on a daily basis, what's generally your favorite wager? Win and exacta. I keep it very, very simple. I'm not, I just don't get into the sequential wagers unless I'm on an absolute roll. Sometimes you get on a hot streak and everything you do is right i'm not on one of those streaks right now so i'm keeping it relatively simple when when the when the odds are right and exact especially if i can throw out the favorite all we need are nine singles or i should say 10 singles from our seminar guest today brad free we'll be making money and walk out of here with a smile on our face we're going to find out who brad likes on today's big cap card but before we do any of that let's toss the microphone over to track announcer frank miramani and get the early changes on today's card here at santa anita Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and happy Big Cap Day. Welcome to Santa Anita Park. For those of you on track, the first 500 should head down to the East Paddock Gardens, where there's an autograph session with Hall of Famer Corey Nakatani and trainer Doug O'Neill. They'll be autographing this great picture of Lava Man, the first 500 between now and 11.45, so another 15 minutes or so in the East Paddock Gardens. You're welcome to go meet and get an autographed Lava Man picture with Corey Nakatani and Doug O'Neill. The condition of the track today is good, and the turf course also listed as good. The rail on the turf is out zero feet. Here are the early changes on the big cap card. No changes in the first start of the 50 cent early pick five. In the second race, scratch number two, Kahuna Magic. There's no high five wagering. 
in race number two. In the third, scratch five, highly desirable. Race four, program scratch of number four. There is a middle pick four offered today on races four, five, six, and seven. to the fifth race. It's the beginning of the $1 pick six. No changes. The sixth race is the DK Horse San Felipe Stakes. Grade two event. Scratch number three, Nisos. With that scratch, there's no show wagering. In fact, there was no show wagering before that scratch. And a revised morning line has been posted. The seventh is the grade one Frank E. Kilro Mile. It kicks off the all turf pick three, as well as the late pick four. No changes in the Frank E. Kilro. The eighth and featured event is the Santa Anita Handicap presented by Yamava Resort and Casino. Number three, Mixto, races with blinkers on. Ninth race kicks off the golden hour pick four, scratch number 13, Aventap. And the 10th, the grade two, Buena Vista, scratch two, 30 carats, scratch five, kissed by fire. Two and five out of the Buena Vista. Enjoy Big Cap Day at the Great Race Place. Remember that we do have special racing tomorrow. First post tomorrow will be at 12.30 p.m. We added that program due to the cancellation of yesterday's card. Bonus race. Let's go back to Quigley's Corner. Resume the seminar. Tom's special guest today is the Daily Racing Forum's Brad Free. Welcome back. We're talking horse with Brad Free. He's the handicapper and reporter for Southern California for the Daily Racing Forum. We know in 1979 he was working for the Pasadena Star News. I also know you had a little bit of a, what's the word I'm looking for, an assignment for lack of a better word with the Racing Times as well. When did you officially first start with the Daily Racing Forum? How long ago was it, Brad? I believe it was 1993. I always, my wife always corrects me. I think it might have been 92. <laughs> it was in the early 90s. So I'm a veteran at this stage of the game. Racing Times was before that. Racing Times was before that that national um sports daily was before that wow. and i got my start at the pasadena star news did you ever meet frank deford the uh, the editor of uh, the national sports daily he was the one who hired me at the national sports was he daily. a horse guy he loved horse racing and he was a fantastic um one of the best sports writers you would possibly ever read the late frank deford and it turns out we had something um in common with our families he had a, a child who died of cystic fibrosis i have a niece and nephew who have cystic fibrosis who are now approaching they're both in their 30s right now, which wow. goes to show you how far that the um, you know treatment of that disease has come. That's something that we always talked about. I was actually laid off of the National Sports Daily, and after because they, they downsized and then eventually went out of business. But even after I was laid off, Frank DeFord would reach out to me every now and then, and just to see how I was doing. That was the type of guy he was, and a great sports writer. You rub shoulders with a lot of important people in race within racing as well, and one of them that comes to mind is Andy Byer, the creator creator of the buyer speed figures, which you can find exclusively in the daily racing form. And before that in the racing times, have you like had dinner, talk to Andy? I know you do a lot of webinars with him and stuff like that. Have you ever spent a day at the races with Andy and kind of pick his brain? We spent a lot of time together. In fact, when buyer uh, would come, come down and spend the summer at Del Mar, we would go bike riding like three times a week together. He's a, he was an avid bike rider. I'm not sure if he still is. I still am. <laughs> Well, it's how I keep thin and trim like that, Tim. Uh, so anyway, yeah, no, Byer and I talk quite often, actually. And there's, you know, sometimes you'll ask me, you know, what happened to the racetrack? Or was there wind? Or did they track, you know, the, sure. a, a track variant that makes, the numbers don't make sense. makes no sense? And so he'll ask me, you know, did anything happen? So we talk all the time. And Byer's one of the greatest storytellers of all time. I think I have every single book that he's written. I still haven't had the courage to ask him to sign a book for me, though. So I need to get. <laughs> buyer to sign like picking winners um just so i can 
have that for my keepsake. We're going to try and pick winners on this seminar. We've got 10 races to get through. So let's kick things off, Brad, in race number one, which begins the popular 50 cent early pick five. We're going one mile on the turf course for Calbred, three year old fillies, allowance optional claiming types, non winners of one other than the rails today are at zero feet. And as I mentioned earlier, the turf course is listed as good. We've got a field of eight. Moyne Lane favorite in the current betting choices on the bottom, number eight, Loretta Lynn. First time on the turf course. Before we get your thoughts on the race, Brad, we want to watch a workout for Loretta Lynn. This is back on February 25th. There's going to be a lot of action as we start to show the workout. And what I want you to pay attention to is the runner who's in the red cap. You can see the runner in the red cap that's kind of in between horses. As this workout continues down the backside, one thing you'll see, and that's Loretta, Loretta Lynn, by the way, in the red cap, is Loretta Lynn right there has to kind of steady and check out of there. Now, one of the things I want you to pay attention to as we're continuing to watch the workout is the horse kind of looming up on the outside with the white blaze and the shadow roll in the uh, blue cap is none other than Newgrange, who is going to be our morning line favorite in the big cap later on this afternoon. So the fact that Loretta, Loretta Lynn can even keep pace with a grade one winner like uh, Newgrange is certainly something very very impressive since this is only her third lifetime start this afternoon. But there she is in the red cap. She's going to be down inside. And as I always like to say when we watch these workouts, courtesy of our friends at XBTV.com, look how effortless the, the exercise rider is trying on Loretta Lynn. He's not asking her at all. And yet that's Newgrange on the outside. She's keeping pace with them. And they're going to basically hit the wire together in 59 seconds flat. So in my opinion, Brad, a very, very impressive workout. You feel the same way? Absolutely. And I'm so glad you were able to show that. I was out here last Sunday morning when that workout took place. That was Victor Espinoza on Newgrange, and he looked super. And I did not know at the time that, that was Loretta Lynn down on the inside. She actually galloped out alongside Newgrange on, after the Unbelievable. wire. Unbelievable. And so I think that answers the question. This is the first start for Loretta Lynn in three months. Is she ready? We just saw. No yeah, doubt. Yeah, she's ready. Yeah, no, she, that question is, can she handle the turf? She's by Grayson. <laughs> any, any more question questions? Answer, right? <laughs> exactly. exactly. No, she. I think she's the horse to beat. However, number five, Asada Fries, it has a little bit more seasoning. She's proven on grass. She's taken a drop in class off a runner-up finish last time out. You know, I expected more from Asada Fries last out. I, I thought she would win that race. Um, maybe I underestimated Grand Slam Smile, the winner that day of the Cal Cup Oaks. Um, she actually earned a, a really good number on Thoroughgraph, 11 and three quarters. She got a 65 buyer. Asada Fries did. She's more seasoned. We know she handles grass. But to me, I like the up-and-comer comebacker, uh, Loretta Lynn. So 8-5 for me in that order. Let's take a look at race number two. Begins the 50-cent early pick four. We're sprinting six and a half furlongs in the main track. This is a starter optional climbing race. One scratch. Scratch the two. Kahuna Magic leaves us with a field of six. Number six, Top Gun, Tony, Top Gun Tommy is the 8-5 to five more in line favorite. First off the claim for trainer Kristen Mulhall. Five consecutive wins. Is, is, is it going to be uh, six consecutive wins today, Brad? I think so. You know, here's an interesting trivia question for him. I'm going to throw you a curveball. We're only in the early, in early March. The meet opened December 26th. How many horses do you believe have won two or more races? I can tell you who won three races only because you wrote about it the other day. That would be a rough ride. Right. How many have won two or more? I'll guess one more. This one. No. 31 horses. Wow. Have, I, think, I was stunned. Wow. I was stunned to find that out. And Top Gun Tommy can join Rough Ride uh, as the only three-time winner at the meet. He's drawn well. His numbers are good. He's won four in a row. Um, he defeated the second choice in the race, Disco Ball, already, who I suspect is a little vulnerable at six and a half furlongs, Disco Ball. Top Gun Tommy has been claimed five consecutive races, runs well for whoever trains the horse. Kristen Mohall will saddle him up this afternoon. I think Top Gun Tommy wins with a, a kind of a pace pressing trip. The, the long shot I'd like to finish second is going to be coming from behind. That's number three, Princip. And nothing against Disco Ball. I just have seen him give it up in deep stretch. If this was three quarters, I wouldn't be going against Disco Ball. But at six and a half, I think the Disco Ball might be suspect. So I like Top Gun Tommy with Princip to come along and pick up the pieces for a second. Six, three. Race number three. We're back on the turf course going one mile. This race is for maiden special eight, Phillies and Mares. Scratch the five, highly desirable. Leaves us with a field of seven. The morning line favorite number six, Den of Inequity. For a new trainer in Southern California, Jack Steiner, who typically plies his trade up in Northern California at a very high percentage, he's going to move down here to Southern California, as are many other Northern California trainers. I welcome them with open arms because I like seeing new faces, whether it's trainers, jockeys, or horses. I, I bet Jack Steiner... Uh, last year or the year before, he had a horse down here running a stakes race. A great guy, and his stats are sensational. I mean, you can see this year he's winning at a 28% clip. 
Um, the thing about his starter, Den of Iniquity, who I believe is the horse to beat, there's no doubt about it, finished second last time out. Five starts into her career, four runner-up finishes and one-third. So how much trust can you put in a filly who kind of likes to run alongside horses as opposed to putting them away? She's the best, fastest horse in the race, fastest on numbers. I think she's the horse to beat. I d do not trust her at a short number. Number one, well-funded, stretches out off a, a, I thought, a respectable career debut. It was in a dirt sprint, and now she's running long on grass. But the filly who beat her, Princess of Time, came back to win an allowance race recently. Well-funded, could be the speed of the field. If you had to, you know, you she's trained by Bob Baffert, by the way. If, if Baffert has a hole in his game, it's long on grass. He doesn't have too many grass horses in his stable. Um, when they do run on grass, it's often because maybe they just don't show much on dirt. But his win percentage in uh, maiden turf routes, four for his last 34. Uh, with a significant flat bet loss. I still picked her second well-funded because I, I think she has ability and she could potentially make the lead. But I like the career maiden after five starts, Den of Iniquity, 6-1. Before we take a look at race number four, Brad, a question for you. You talked about how last Sunday you were out here and you happened to see that work with a little Loretta Lynn that we just showed. Your job is a tough one because not only do you have to handicap, but then you kind of walk the beat on the backside and try and find out stories. Do you kind of just walk in there hoping to maybe bump into some people? Do you have an agenda? I mean, you know, there's so much activity on the backside in the morning. Just by being there, you have to try and you have to kind of stumble into stories. I actually have a list. I, I compose a list the night before. And so when I get up at 4.30 in the morning, to be out here, I like to be out here at 6 when I'm out here in the morning. There are certain guys I know I can find them where I can find them at 6 a.m., usually in their stable office. D'Amato is one of them. Uh, John Sadler is another. And I have a list of, you know, questions and horses that I need to ask them about. I was fortunate enough to watch the workout uh, by Newgrange because I had been out to San Anita the day before, and D'Amato said, yeah, Newgrange is working Sunday morning at 6.30. I said, okay, I see you then. Um, so I was able to watch that workout unfold. But I keep a list because, you know, when you get to be my age, you start forgetting stuff, and you have to have something to rely on. It's like Peyton's place, though, right? There's always going to be stories on the backside. Some of them might be rumors. Some of them might yeah. not be uh, fit to print. But nevertheless, I'm sure you kind of, quote, unquote, stumble into a lot of interesting uh, information. Listen, at the racetrack, people love to talk. <laughs> Race number four begins a 50 cent middle pick for on today's 10 race card we're offering a 50 cent middle pick for and we kick it off going one mile on the main track for sixteen thousand dollar claimers non-winners of two races lifetime program scratch of the four leaves us with a field of eight number three vendetta joe is from the vladimir serin Bart is the five to two morning line favorite these low level claimers condition claimers always seem to be tricky to me i don't know what the statistics show but it always seems like they kind of come in and out of form pretty quickly well they do but in the case of vendetta joe i i think he towers over this field on speed figures and speaking of stats one of my favorite stats in drf's formulator program is how does a trainer do when he or she starts a favorite how do they do when they are expected to do well well Bendetta joe is trained by vladimir serin and over the last five years his win rate with favorites 57 for 126 that's a 45 percent win rate and get this a flat bet profit if you just bet every Serin train favorite, you're going to make money, which is kind of unusual. So ben and that's over five years. That's over five years. Right. It's an incredible stat. Um, and again, you can find that in Formulator. But ben which, by the way, is an incredible tool. I'm a subscriber right. to Formulator. I don't know what we did before. I, I know we kept stacks of racing forms in the closet, but there's yeah. no way you could kind of create this own information, meaningful information on your own. Yeah, no doubt about it. It's a great tool. Just like the XBTV workouts are a great tool as well. Buyer speed figures. I mean, there's so many tools we have available right now that we did not have 20, 30 years ago. Um, how did we do it back then? You had to keep uh, keep. I'm old enough to remember you had to watch race replays on the call-in center at Hollywood Park or San Diego where you <laughs> called up and requested a replay. Exactly. That was before the internet. I know. Now if you, if you don't get there, if, you're, if your screen starts buffering, you know, you get all upset you about it. Tantrum. Yeah. Ben Dedda Joe, I think, towers over the field. It's a 16 N2 out to the lowest class level for winners in Southern California. I can see him going off at a very short price. Price. Second preference in the race, number six, take action, only because he hasn't run at this level yet, and he's never run long long yet. So he's trying a couple different things, and sometimes that can wake a horse up, stretching out, dropping in class, take action, my second preference. But uh, all in all, really, Bendetta Joe, to me, is one of the most probable winners on the card. Back on the turf course for the start of the $1 pick six, race five. We're going one mile on the turf course. It's for allow 
plus optional claiming types. Non-winners of one other than a good field of nine. Number five, Crosby Beach from the Mark Latbarn is the eight to five morning line favorite. I don't want to spoil the secret, but I do know you like this horse quite a bit, Brad. Yeah, the most probable winner on the card, in my opinion, is number five, Crosby Beach. Um, he's taken a huge class drop from N2X to N1X uh, it, and running for the optional $50,000 claim tag. Now, oftentimes you go, well, why is this horse dropping in class? You know, in this case, it makes sense. He, they, he, they claimed him for $50,000 off a win three starts back, ran him twice at the N2X level. He wasn't quite good enough. Now he's back at the level at which he was claimed. He's the fastest horse in the race on numbers. He has enough tactical speed to sit right behind the pace of the race that's likely to be set by, uh, well, one of the contenders of, to set the paces on the outside, stamp my passport. Um, I, he's going to get first run over his main rival, Truly Quality. And Crosby Beach's most recent third place finish was already validated when Goliad came out of that race to win a stakes race next time out. So Crosby Beach, he's the best horse in the race, most probable winner on the card, in my opinion. A couple of questions for you regarding race number five, Brad. Scattered throughout today's card, there's a number of runners returning off extended layoffs, and in particular in race number five, number six, Genius Jimmy, and number seven, Seven Wonders. We haven't seen them since uh, March and September, respect respectively. You know, we talk about formula. You can certainly look up trainer statistics that way. We talk about XPTV.com. You can look at their workouts that way as well. Do you typically tend to like horses, have one comeback or two comeback races first? Does it vary? I'm just trying to get an idea, generally speaking, how you evaluate yeah. layoffs. Runners. Generally speaking, it all depends on the type of uh, race that the horse is in. If a horse is coming in off a layoff, like say into a stakes race, I'm going to assume that there's a reason why that horse is in the stakes race. Particularly if it's from a good barn. Ex exactly. Well, only if it's from a good yeah. barn. If it's from a not so good barn, that does not apply. In the case of an allowance race like this one, it's a little bit trickier. I don't know if they're, you know, need, if the horse needs a prep. In the case of Genius Jimmy, Michael McCarthy doesn't always win first start back but there have been some recent exceptions princess of time comes to mind immediately we just talked about her she won her comeback off a long layoff genius jimmy was good enough last year to at least take a shot in the grade two san felipe he showed ability as a three-year-old he's lightly raced he could fire first start back but i prefer a horse with current form in this situation pete yurton trains number seven seven wonders and he's a guy whose stats have improved enormously of late with comebackers you can see it's in the daily raising form pps 21 percent coming in off of a layoff of between two and six months so seven wonders i guess the question is is he good enough yeah, he is good enough, and he'll be forwardly placed. He'll get first run over Crosby Beach. Um, I still prefer a horse. When, it, when a horse has proven form and is in the right spot and has the right numbers, he or she is usually tough to beat. I think that th that's the case with Crosby Beach. Race number six is the first of four stakes races on today's big cap card, and we kick off the 50-cent late pick five in race number six with the grade two DK horse San Felipe stakes for three-year-olds, traveling a mile and a sixteenth on the main track. Big scratch of the original one to five morning line favorite. Niso still leaves us with a field of four. Now the revised morning line favorite, also from the Bob Baffert part, is on the, is on the bottom. Number five, a imagination who's eight to five according to john white what's this race according to brad free this is a very interesting race and like you said earlier tom now you can at least bet on the race if you have an opinion i, I would honestly would not be surprised if any of these four horses win i'm going to say the same thing about the big cap in a few minutes um i ended up with the horse i think his hand is forced from the inside and it's scatify he got beat a country mile last time out by nisos everybody gets beat a country mile by nisos and wind me up got the best of scatify but scatify had missed a workout going into the Bob Lewis, and it was only his second career start and his first start around two turns. So you have to ask yourself, does this horse have a license to improve? Well, of course he does. He hasn't missed a workout since then. He now has a route race under his belt. And if Berrios lets him roll from the inside, he could take them wire to wire. Problem is, the two Baffers both have enough speed to keep Scatify company. He's not going to be loose out front, but I think he can take this field all the way around. Regarding the maiden McVeigh, why is he in this race? Well, there aren't any maiden dirt routes to in which to run, and he also has ability. He's shown a lot of ability. He's still green um, in his workouts and in his races, but this is a million-dollar set of constitution, a million two five, who has ability, and he's his. I know it doesn't look like it on form, but his last start when he got beat 12 lengths by Nisos was better than his runner-up finish in, the, in his maiden race on January 20th. So McVeigh is headed the right way. Sooner or later, the light bulb switch is going to go on, and McVeigh could become an important horse. I picked Scatify 
or scratched into Scatify, overwind me up, but I respect Imagination, who got beat by a very good horse, May Moon, and McVeigh, who I think we haven't seen the best of yet. McVeigh, the longest shot on the field, according to the morning line. Five to one on the revised morning line for number four, McVeigh, in race number six. Race number seven is the grade one, Frankie Kilroy Mile, $300,000 guaranteed as the purse. One supplement in the race, it's number seven, McKinnon, who's also a first-time gelling. Race number seven also begins the 50-cent late pick five, excuse me, the late pick four, and the $3 all-turf pick three the morning line favorite number two easter who you mentioned brad earlier is on a two stakes race winning streak good race here how'd you go who'd you like and why i think the two favorites kind i won't say they tower over the field but i think they're pretty obvious one of them is easter who seeks his third consecutive win and the other one is a comebacker and you, you, we mentioned talked earlier tom about comebackers you know is du jour it does he need the start is he in for a prep race no i don't think so it's a bob baffert trained grass horse and he ran second in this race a year ago i believe that du jour's the company lines that he has been running against are just a little bit better than what easter has faced but it's a it's a really close call between two very good horses and du jour is training lights out andy harrington gave him a b plus off that 112 workout uh february 24th he is ready to fire du jour is and by the way last year when he lost by a neck to damato trained gold phoenix the course that day was listed good so i think a wet course is not going to be a problem for du jour goliad is the horse to catch and he's a fun horse to watch because he i just love horses that go out there and just gas it on the Come front and end catch me is what he says exactly right? but first piece to his outside could actually sit a good trip sitting second. Goliad and first piece help ensure a fast pace. I think that Easter and or my top choice du jour will run them down late. Race number eight is the feature race on today's card. It's the grade one Sandy to Handicap presented by Yamava Resort and Casino. $400,000 is the purse. They're traveling the classic, di classic distance of a mile and a quarter. Take note number three, Mixed Dope adds blinkers. That is not in the racing form or in the program. That's a late uh, addition. Blinkers on to number three, Mixed Dope. Morning line favorite on the bottom and the highway to 124 pounds is number seven, Newgrange. Five to two on the morning line. Before we get thoughts on the race, Brad, let's take a watch. Let's uh, watch the replay of the San Pasquale. Three of these runners exit that to race, including the winner Newgrange. That race uh, that we're going to watch the replay for was at a mile and an eighth. Today's distance is a mile and a quarter. Let's listen to Frank Miramonte describe the action. And they're off in the San Pasquale and Stiletto Boy fires out of there. But it was very even as they line up across the track. New Grange is showing plenty of speed. I'm going to be somebody in between those two. Mixto on the far outside. Newgate is fifth, but just two lengths off the speed. They're followed by Mr. Fisk, who has to go four wide into the turn and two rivers over at the back of a fairly compact group. Seven eights out. And it's New Grange setting the tempo. Leads by one length over Mixto in second. Stiletto Boy is down on the inside third. They're followed by Newgate, one from the outside. Mr. Fisk just outside of him. I'm going to be somebody now four off the lead, steadying in between rivals slightly, and two rivers over inches up at the rail. It's Newgrange onto the back stretch past the 5 8 pole in control, striding along smoothly. A length and a half in front of Mixto's second. At the rail, two rivers overtakes third and is willing, moving up within a length and a half of the lead. Newgate is just outside of him. They're followed by Stiletto Boy, who's racing inside Mr. Fisk. And then being pushed along, I'm going to be somebody. Three-eighths of a mile to run, and it's Newgrange, who's been the controlling speed. Three-quarters to Mixto in second. Newgate set down on the outside of them. At the rail, two rivers over, has three to make up. Then Stiletto Boy and Mr. Fisk. They pass the quarter pole and turn for home. Newgrange, Newgate comes after him now. These two are going to square off at the eighth pull a good effort from two rivers over who's fighting down at the rail and then mixto past the eighth pole new grange still in front a length and a half newgate giving it his all but new grange has plenty left in the tank and it's back to back in the san pasqual for new grange under victor Brad, Newgrange made every poll a winning poll in the San Pasquale that we just watched. But, of course, uh, Newgate loomed up at the top of the stretch, flattened out. And Mixto kind of ran an interesting race, loomed up, then uh, kind of went backwards, and then kind of came forward again as they got closer to the wire. He might appreciate the uh, increase in distance. But as you mentioned at the beginning, literally all seven runners have a possibility of winning this race. Every single horse in the field has a shot, in my opinion. And, you know, there's a couple that are maybe a little marginal. Reincarnate coming in off a layoff. Subsanador, his... 
U.S. debut was less than ideal, but he's a Group 1 winner in South America, so he has back credentials. Um, the other five, I think, are legit. Even Mixto is going to be a little bit of a price. Uh, Tom, there have been 36 stakes races run this meet. Favorites have won 22 of them. That's a 61% win rate for favorites. So maybe I'm overthinking it a little bit because the morning line favorite, number seven, Newgrange, you can't knock him. He has tactical speed. He has only one main pace rival. That's Newgate, who he already defeated. And we saw in his workout that we showed earlier that Newgrange is on top of his game right now. Ever since Phil D'Amato put him in a, a once-a-month uh, pattern of races he fires every single time he's tactical he can go to the lead or he can sit second he drew well i guess the only real question is can he go a mile and one quarter we just saw him win the san pasqual he wasn't slowing down much in the lane and i think he's the right horse newgate is kind of interesting because that was only his second start off a layoff and all he had was a sprint going in. So if any horse has a license to take a giant step forward, it would be Newgate, who I didn't pick in the top three. It might have been a mistake. My second choice in the race is number two, Highland Falls. Um, the Brad Cox trained son of Curlin out of a Breeders' Cup distaff winner round pond. And the speed figures that Highland Falls earned in his last two wins, a one other than a two other than, are as good as anybody in the big cap field. The one knock I have on Highland Falls, for what it's worth, the field that he defeated at Fairgrounds last time out, the second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth place finishers all ran back. None of them won. They all either matched their effort or regressed. So my point is maybe Highland Falls won that race because he was running against a suspect field. But Brad Cox sent him out here for a reason. On numbers, he's one of the favorites. And then a horse that I did not pick in the top two is a horse that I will use on whatever tickets I end up playing is Salesman. He hasn't started since November 4th. That was Breeders' Cup weekend. His first U.S. start on dirt, and he crushed. We haven't seen him since then. He had one minor hiccup. He was supposed to run once this meet. He had a minor hiccup, not a big deal. Training super for Dick Mandela, who I think he's won three big caps already. And salesman, to me, is the a potential upsetter. But I'm siding with the two horses, um, or at least the one horse with speed, number seven, Newgrange. I respect Highland Falls. And salesman at 6-1 to one is very intriguing. Two races to go. And take a look at the field sizes for our final two races. That's important because race number nine begins the $1 Golden Hour Pick 4, linking our last two races here with the last two races at our sister track, Golden Gate up north. And we kick things off in the Golden Hour Pick 4, coming down the hillside turf course for Phillies and Mares. It's a straight allowance race. Scratch the also eligible number 13. Lead us with a full field of 12, the lukewarm morning line favorite who set a career best buyer speed figure last time out. Number eight, don't you forget seven. 72 lukewarm morning line favorite. How'd you see race nine, Brad? I wish I had a strong opinion in this race, and I'm not even sure that the horse I picked um, is is worth gambling on. But if she starts at 12 to one, which is her morning line, I don't see why not. Number nine, Just Nails, had to need her most recent start. She hadn't started since last summer, and they did not allow her to use her speed in that race. They kind of took her back. She got into a bumping match with, I believe it was with, don't you forget, turning for home, got blocked in behind horses, and then just kind of gave way. It was a comeback race that was not as bad as the seventh place finish suggests. I believe that she can take a step forward second time out. Blinkers are off, but she does have speed. And, you know, we know she has ability from what we saw last summer. Um, there's a lot of questions in this race, but a 12 to one, I'm going to take a shot. I don't have a whole lot of conviction, but I like number nine, just nails. And you have to respect the morning line favorite number eight. Don't you forget whose runner up finish last time out was terrific. She got a big number out of the race. Um, there really no knocks other than price nine, eight without much conviction. Close out the day in race number 10, offering $5 golden hour daily double wagering. Similar concept as the golden hour pick four. last race here with the last race of golden gaining is the grade two Buena Vista stakes for uh, Phillies and mares, four year olds and up two scratches, scratch the two and scratch the five leaves us with a field of nine more line favorite. Number six, Ruby Nell from the Richard Mandela barn. Not going to have time to show the replay, Brad, Brad, but she last ran in the Pegasus world cup, Philly and mare turf race at Gulfstream park. She had a substitute jockey. Edwin Molinaro was just returning from an injury. He suffered 
Harper Day, elected to write Frankie DeTore. First time on her back when they broke the gates open, she didn't get to the lead. That probably compromised her chances. It, it did compromise her chances. There's no doubt about it. And trainer Richard Mandela takes full responsibility because he told DeTore going in, look, this filly will take off if you're not careful. Well, DeTore was careful. He kind of rode to instructions and raided Ruby Nell, and that's not how she likes to run. And she she's, still ran great. She's kind of the Philly version of Goliath, also trained yes. by Mandela. She likes to get out there and do her thing. Um, Maldonado is back aboard her this afternoon, and there's a key scratch out of this race. Number five, Kissed by Fire, who is a stretch-out sprinter with speed, is out of the race. And I think that if Maldonado wants to push the button when they leave the gate, Ruby Nell could make the lead, and she should be gone. Her win in the Lady Shamrock was super. Uh, Maldonado allows her to use her best weapon, and she's definitely the horse to catch. The long shot in this race, I think 8-1 to one qualifies as a long shot, is number one, Be Your Best, facing older Phillies and Mares for the first time, but her numbers are good. She's fresh. She's going to be running late. Her runner-up finish last time out to Anaset was very creditable. Anaset is going to be one of the top Phillies or Mares later this year. She's just starting back for Leonard Powell. But be your best. I believe she's ready to fire first start back. I know it's a little bit shorter distance than she normally runs, but that's my choice is 6-1. Ruby Nell, be your best. As if there wasn't enough wagering action at Sandy, we've got one more wager for you to take a look at. It's the Coast to Coast Pick 5. It always pays well. It's a dollar wager linking our races here at uh, Sandy with races at our sister track, Gulfstream Park. Today's Coast to Coast Pick 5 starts in Gulfstream Park, race 10. Post time for that will be 1.36 p.m. Pacific time. Brad, it is always a treat doing the seminar with you. The time flies by whenever we can rap about horses. Let's try and do it again sometime Thanks soon. for having me. Had a fun. Thanks for watching as well. Hope you enjoyed it. Next voice you hear me tracking on some Frank Miramati updating us with changes. Have fun on Big Cap Day, everybody, and good luck. Ladies and gentlemen. We ask that you direct your attention to the winner's circle as well as the flagpole in the infield as we welcome Kyla Nicole Healy, who will perform the Star Spangled Banner. Kyla Nicole Healy is an international performing artist, a jazz singer, actress, and professional dance performer from Long Island, New York. Her first jazz album releases this month. She has performed from an early age across many stages, including leading roles in Broadway productions Cabaret and Streetcar Named Desire. She is an old soul with a new spirit. Please rise to honor America as we proudly present our national anthem. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fire. O'er the ramparts we watched Were so gallantly streaming And the rockets record The bombs bursting in air the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave for the
Thank you, Katie Welsh, for our national anthem. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Big Cap Day at Santa Anita Park. The main track and turf both rated as good. Rail on the turf at zero feet. Here are the changes. No changes in race one. In the second, scratch number two, Kahuna Magic, there's no high five wagering. In the third, scratch five, highly desirable. Race four starts the middle pick four, scratch number four, Tokamak. In the fifth race, we start the $1 pick six with no changes. Race six, the DK Horse San Felipe Stake, scratch number three, Nisos, there's no show wagering. There is a revised morning line. In the seventh, start of the all-turf pick three, the Frankie Kilroy Mile, there are no changes. The eighth is the Santa Anita Handicap, presented by Yamava Resort and Casino. Put the blinkers on, number three, mixed up. It's nine, scratch number 13, Aventap. It's the start of the golden hour, pick four. Race 10, the Buena Vista, scratch two, 30 carats and five, kissed by fire. Enjoy Big Cap Day at Santa Anita Park. Post time for the opener is in 24 minutes at 12.30. We once again are proudly offering the Coast to Coast Pick 5. There have been some outstanding payoffs. Combining races from Gulfstream and Santa Anita Park every Saturday and Sunday, low 15% takeout, $1 minimum wager. The Coast to Coast Pick 5 starts with Gulfstream's 10th at 1.36 Pacific.
Glorious day of racing on Sunday at Santa Anita, topped by the big cap. The Santa Anita Handicap goes as the eighth race on the program. Mile and one quarter classic on the main track for older horses as we look at the field of seven, four of which exit the same race. That was the San Pasquale to prep for this race. And as you can see in the stretch, New Grange is in front. New Gate is on the outside second, and these two are going to battle to the wire, but New Grange is going to shrug off the challenge, and he is going to win this race by a length. I thought New Gate was ridden poorly, though, in this race. I thought he was taken off the pace. He needs to be on or near the lead, and I think he'll be closer this time uh, with a switch to Frankie DeTore. But New Grange is likely the one to beat because he comes off that prep win, and in fact, he's won his last two. Now, having said that, I don't think any of these horses really want to go a mile and a quarter. And I also think the pace might be a little quicker, which leads me to a newcomer, a fresh face, an invader, if you will. And that's number two, Highland Falls. Now, he's no long shot. He's three to one on the morning line, even though this will be his first start in a stakes race, shipping in for Brad Cox from Fairgrounds, where he won his last two in a row. And he did it stylishly. And he did it with... Numbers that make him a very strong fit at this level, even though he's moving up in class. So let's go with number two, Highland Falls, the shipper from Fairgrounds, to pull off a mild surprise and win the big cap Sunday at Santa Anita.